governor's dilemma whether to extend its stay home order as the statewide order expires. Neighboring cities and counties are also wondering, and we know when you're going to find out. Conflicting messages on whether Colorado is short on personal protective equipment. Denver bans drinking in parks. Did you know you could drink in parks? Well, you can't anymore. From the mountains to the prairies, we look at different communities taking different approaches to this stage of the fight against COVID-19. And you don't need to choose between watching this program and getting outside. Do both at once. Next. Denver is going to be told to stay home until May 8th. That announcement from Denver Mayor Michael Hancock is going to come tomorrow morning. For everyone who lives in the surrounding parts of the metro area, as the late great Paul Harvey used to say, stand by for news. Here's what we know is going on tonight. The state of Colorado is lifting its stay home order on Sunday, but has not provided direct guidance on how things are going to work on Monday. As a result of that uncertainty, cities and counties have been talking to each other about whether they should go in together on a mutual stay home order in lieu of state action. Aurora Mayor Mike Kaufman said that a number of public health leaders in the metro area have real concerns about lifting the statewide order this soon. Then you've got the issue in Douglas County, where Republicans considered firing the public health officials when they first brought up the idea of a stay home order. So as you might imagine, there are probably some tense discussions going on tonight about who exactly is going to follow Denver's lead in extending to May 8th tomorrow morning. As Paul Harvey used to say, stand by for news. The news today out of the state health department on the numbers was not great. Colorado has once again seen its largest single day increase in reported deaths. Now, again, a reminder, the state says these are delayed numbers that come in from various counties. Today's update is that the state knows of 552 people who have died. That is an increase of 44. More than 11,000 cases are known, more than 52,000 people tested. The number of people in the hospital is holding steady in the high 800s. I mean, steady is better than increasing, but that number is not really dropping. You know that 77 people have been discharged in the last day. Now, we can expect to see the number of reported deaths in our state from COVID-19 increase significantly in the coming days and weeks. And the reason is because coroners and state health officials are going back through cases of people who previously died, deaths that were not classified as coronavirus, but on second reflection, they may decide to classify them as such. So Governor Jared Polis said yesterday that the state is good on PPE. We have the supplies that we need. The day that he said that, 20 hospitals were telling the state health department that they were going to run out of personal protective equipment within seven days. I asked state health leaders about that today, that seeming discrepancy, and they said there's plenty of supplies in the pipeline for those hospitals. Because of the urgency of all of this and how hard it is to get PPE, we're not stockpiling it. We're pushing it out to our partners. So we do have enough. So... Today's update, 20 hospitals saying they're going to run out in a week, dropped to eight. So the Hospital Association statewide says we've gone from a, about 20% of hospitals in that predicament to 10%. Let's talk about the situation at home. We've heard from a number of you who said that you were told to expect unemployment benefits by the beginning of this week, and it did not happen. The state, again, says that their system is overwhelmed and overburdened. They acknowledge that about 95,000 Coloradans should have received benefit payments between Tuesday or between Sunday and Tuesday. You'd be getting the regular unemployment plus the extra $600 from the federal government. But the state system bogged down again. My team is uh, doing its absolute best to where, where there are pain points addressing those pain points as quickly as humanly possible, such that we can get benefits into people's hands. State says that the money that should have been to people by Tuesday should begin coming in today. We do want you to keep us updated on that. Denver is banning drinking in city parks until July 23rd. You didn't know that you couldn't drink. You could drink at Denver city parks. Well, you could till now. Very sorry about that. Put it this way.
So now you can't drink booze in a Denver park. You can't drink in Cheeseman after dark. Not even that old 3-2 beer or a flute of champagne, my dear. Ain't no claws that'll avoid these laws. No chugging trulies and getting unruly. City Park is divine after a box of wine, but you try that now, you're going to get fined. Eagle County is the very first county in Colorado to reopen some of its businesses. Governor Polis virtually joined a meeting of the county commissioners today to say that they were approving that exemption, the first in the state. State health officials made the call to allow Eagle County, which was hit early and hard and put in restrictions early to reopen certain parks and businesses provided that the people there use social distancing. Skiers could be doing runs at Aspen Highlands by the end of May. SkiCo says they are considering opening up if local and state guidelines allow it. They do not have a set date for that. Obviously, social distancing would apply, so people would be spaced out six feet in line. Food service would likely be to go only, and again, it's only if the state and local health departments give the okay. We talked about the fact that rural hospitals, a lot of them were cash strapped before the pandemic. Now that situation has gotten even worse. And a number of them, when they asked the federal government for the aid that's being given out, were only given a few days worth of funding. Let's bring in Nine News reporter Anusha Roy, who's been following this for us. And Anusha, these rural hospitals, even if they're not seeing a lot of COVID-19 cases, they do play an important role in, in case load management around the state. Yeah, Kyle, a lot of them are the only hospitals in the county and for hundreds of miles around them. And now they're the ones that are bringing in recovering COVID-19 patients to alleviate the patient load on hospitals in other parts of Colorado. Now, a month ago, a lot of these hospitals only had 50 days, less than two months worth of cash on hand. And as you can expect, that is no better today. So because elective procedures are on hold, people aren't showing up for appointments. They're losing out on a lot of their revenue. So that is where federal help is entering the picture. But places like Montrose Memorial Hospital so far has only gotten enough money to help them stay open for six days. Gunnison Valley Health got around a half a million dollars when they could lose 14 million by the end of the year. And the Lincoln Community Hospital said they got enough money to keep them open for nine days. Let me just say it this way. We, we're very grateful for any support that we can get. And so a week is a week that I didn't have before. So the Lincoln County Hospital actually got four patients from the metro area. And it might not sound like a lot, but their total average population in their hospitals is four. So that does help their revenue. And it is important, they were saying, for their health care providers to also feel like they're doing their part to help their colleagues around Colorado as well. So they've lost the income from the elective surgeries, didn't get the federal money that they were looking for. They do have a couple of other places they can look for funding. Yeah, so actually, there is a pool of federal dollars available right now. They just don't know how it's going to be distributed around Colorado and the rest of the country. Of course, there was an aid package passed today specifically setting aside money for hospitals. But, Kyle, at this point, they're also looking at loans. They're looking at philanthropic help as well because they're just trying to find as many ways as possible to keep open and, and not run into a deficit. All right. Anusha Roy, thank you very much, Anusha. Hey, we are continuing to plan our statewide graduation celebration here on Next. A little something for the high school seniors and the college seniors who are looking at either delayed or canceled commencement ceremonies. What we are asking for to make this happen are your videos. All right, so if you are in a family with a graduate, parents, what would you love for the whole state to know about your special graduate in their journey? Students, what would you like to say to the parents and teachers and professors who got you where you are today? And if, if you're a teacher or a professor, what do you wish that you could walk on, say, on stage and say to all of those students and parents in front of you? We continue to gather up all of your videos, and we are going to throw a big old party here on Next. Keep sending them to us. Email us next at 9news.com or give us a shout with the hashtag HeyNext. Democrats have a request for the Republican leader at the Capitol who compared stay-home orders to Nazism. They don't want him to resign. I need him to start doing some work in the community to stop the anti-Semitism. And don't it always seem to go, you don't know what you got till it's gone. Coloradans are sharing what they will not take for granted again. Next. Colorado's Congressman and Republican Party Chairman Ken Buck is remarkably consistent. 
He voted against another COVID-19 pandemic aid bill in Congress today. Broke with every other Republican and Democrat in our state delegation, was one of just five no votes in the House against that bill to provide money for small businesses, hospitals, and testing. This will work better if you can hear me with a mic. Ken Buck's team usually refers us to his Twitter feed for comment, so that's where we went today, where he tweeted that, quote, cannot continue to push through rapid-fire spending packages that leave massive debt burden on our children and grandchildren. COVID-19 has exposed a pre-existing condition for some number of Americans, a condition that doctors cannot diagnose. And today, Democratic legislators in Colorado called out the bigotry linked to COVID-19. There was not a single Republican in attendance. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger found out the reason why is because the Republicans weren't invited. We will not stand for any form of racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism, because hate for one is hate for all. Democratic Representative Daphna Michelson Janae led this group of Democratic lawmakers calling out hate speech and signing onto this letter asking the public to speak up in the face of racism and anti-Semitism. Last month on conservative talk radio, Republican House Minority Leader Patrick Neville said stay-at-home orders lead to a Gestapo-like mentality. I would love an earnest apology, one that really recognizes that he chose poorly in the language that he used. In a text, Neville told me the day after his Gestapo comment, he said a better choice of words would have been authoritarian. Ten years ago this month, another Colorado lawmaker made a Nazi reference. In a Politico article about Arizona's immigration law, where police could ask for ID of someone they suspected to be undocumented, then-Congressman Jared Polis said, I hope that we're not headed on the same trajectory that Nazi Germany was. It wasn't brought up in this news conference. Michelson Janae texted me after that she didn't even know about it. A Republican might have, but they weren't on this Zoom call. From the few phone calls I made today, Republicans didn't know about this. We recognize the difficult position it puts them in because we are specifically calling out um, a statement by their minority leader. And th that is something that they have to uh, deal with internally. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. <laughs> With isolated thunderstorms this afternoon, scattered showers expected overnight with the arrival of a cool front that will come in from the northwest. Highs near 70 today, but a cooler 56 on Friday afternoon. A few welcome rain showers will move through during the day on Friday, but clear out in time for the weekend. But way up high, it's all snow. As a matter of fact, enough snow. National Weather Service has put out a winter weather advisory. In Denver for tonight, cloudy with showers developing are low at 39 degrees. Tomorrow, sunshine and 56 clouds in the afternoon and after. Afternoon rain showers will linger into the evening. Out of here by Saturday, 63 with an isolated storm. And then look at these numbers. Sunshine and 74 Sunday, 78 Monday, 82 next Thursday. Now that's more like it. What's one thing you've told yourself you won't take for granted when this is over? Maybe something that you never thought of was vital until you couldn't do it anymore? Send your thoughts to next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. And when we return, Chris Vanderveen will share what quarantined Coloradans are missing the most. Hey there, I'm not Kyle, I'm Chris, and I'm in a now mostly emptied Nine News newsroom. Recently, we asked our viewers a relatively simple question, but what we got back was something decidedly not so simple. So I asked photojournalist Chris Hansen to help me put this next story together. Alone, yet not apart. It is in isolation where we find unity, a commonality bred in an uncommon time. One story, many chapters, each changing, evolving, as each of us learns the value of what we miss. Little things, seemingly insignificant things, big things, and things that remain immeasurable. Uh, this is Chris Vanderveen. Can you hear me? I sure can. How are you today? Kaylee Clark teaches kindergarten in Aurora. I miss it so much. I, sorry, I'm like emotional. Um, <laughs> I love you guys and we're gonna do this together. 
We asked, you answered, with the kind of answers that remind us of the kind of humanity only a virus can expose. When I stay home and we don't do what we normally do, and um, I miss the mountains. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. How much do you look forward to getting back to work? Oh, I can't wait. You know, there's, it'll bring tears to my eyes to be told, hey, you can go back in and miss it. Do you have a moment to chat? Yeah, this is great. My grandpa that lives in Greeley, we normally do a bi-weekly sushi lunch date, and I haven't been able to see him for over a month now. So how are you holding up? Um, I'm holding up good. I'm used to being around a lot of people, and it's just a lot to adapt to. There's something about taking something for granted and then discovering the value of that one thing you can no longer live without. Appreciation. If we share one thing in an unfamiliar time, it is the appreciation of the familiar, the customary, the once routine. How you doing? How's everything going? I'm doing okay. It's my three other ones that I'm missing the most that are in the picture behind me. How much do you miss them? It's bad. You realize how much you need physical contact with people. It's just really tough. In its cruelty, in its aggression, the virus has failed to weaken our sense of who we are and what we need. I miss her tremendously. I totally miss her. I haven't seen her since March 16th. She just lights up my life. In an uncommon time, our commonality is now a community. And it is there where we just might find the right words, the closing words of a story we are still writing, still living. In a world where we are not as alone, as it might seem. Just hang on. We're going to get through this. We'll be back to a somewhat normal before you know it. Just hang on. We can do it. All right. Talk about the idea of being in it together. You saw it right there. More of your examples of what you will not take for granted. And your feedback next. There's some folks who are pretty dedicated to watching this program, but man, there was some next level dedication going on in Aurora. A viewer of ours, Michael, spotted this. Uh, it's sometimes tough to choose whether you want to enjoy the great outdoors, enjoy this beautiful weather, or uh, watch your favorite TV program. Uh, somebody apparently has just hung uh, a TV from a tree and solved all of their problems at once. Oh, your notes about what you will not take for granted. Christine Livington says she will not take for granted anymore, taking her mom for walks in the sun. Says that her mom has dementia. She can't see her in the senior living facility where she lives. She, she doesn't understand why she doesn't visit her anymore. Uh, yesterday was her birthday. Shua, uh, Katie says she will miss hugs. A lot of people wrote in and said that. A lot of people said that. You know, physical contact. I like Mark's answer. He says, I will not take for granted my wife's patience. Haven't we learned some stuff, a lot of it really good, about our family members through all of this and what they're capable for, uh, capable of? Pam says, here's what I won't take for granted. Going to the library and checking out books. About that. Not everything has to be on a, on a screen. Uh, another woman, Sarah, writes in and says, we'll never take hugging my mother for granted. She works in an emergency room. She has separated herself from our family to limit our exposure risk. I cannot wait to give her a big hug. How about that? We saw visual proof tonight of all of the folks who were in it together just waiting for that moment when we can again reconnect and hopefully never again take for granted all those things that we are missing right now. Thanks for spending some time with us tonight. See you next time.